Hello everyone, welcome back. Today we're going to talk about uh, pollination ecology and the evolution of plant pollinator mutualisms. So let me get everything set up here. All right. So pollination is an extremely old and important mutualism between animals and plants. Now, because plants aren't able to move, they face kind of some unique challenges for sexually reproducing organisms. How are you going to get your gametes from one individual to another without being able to move? It seems like a big problem. So one solution is to actually just do it yourself. So self-pollination is a strategy that a number of plants use to escape the need for insect or animal-mediated pollination. However, there are very few examples of obligately self-compatible plants, that is, plants that exclusively self-pollinate. This is largely due to the evolutionary benefits of cross-pollination, where genes are able to move a considerably greater distance and create novel genetic combinations that are more likely, more likely to confer positive fitness benefits. That means that basically cross-pollination gives you some perks that self-pollination doesn't necessarily get you. So how does a plant go about solving this problem? If it can't move its pollen on its own, what can it rely on? So one way is to rely on some abiotic means of transporting your gametes, such as the wind. In fact, a huge number of anemophilous plants still rely on wind to vector their pollen. Now, such a strategy does have some benefits, uh, and that is the first of which is wind is pretty much a guarantee. So barring being in the very deep depths of a dank tropical forest that's super stagnant, you're probably going to experience wind at some point. Another is that you don't have to rely on any individuals or invest re into rewarding them for their service like a true mutualism would. However, just throwing your gametes out there and hoping for the best is a pretty risky strategy, and plant density needs to be pretty high to ensure even a chance of reproductive success. Moreover, you're probably going to be limited to a pretty short distance of reproduction uh, before the density of gametes is so low that ultimately successful pollination is unlikely to occur. More importantly though, this strategy is hugely wasteful. You need to produce a ton of pollen to have any chance of any reproductive success. Now, if you're a fellow allergy sufferer like I am, oh, this is not gonna work, is it? Uh, this is a, actually a video of a, of a pine tree being felled. And this huge plume that you see in this is a massive cloud of pollen that was released from that pine tree. So if you're an allergy sufferer like me, uh, the sight of this just makes you want to sneeze. And coniferous trees are an example of anemophilous plants, and the amount of pollen that's produced by a single tree is massive. Now think of that across an entire landscape. Pretty crazy. So now all of that tasty, nutritious pollen has got to attract some hungry bugs, right? And indeed it does. In fact, the earliest evidence of pollen consumption comes from the early Permian nearly 300 million years ago through fossilized remains of insects. And pollen is a pretty unique, uh, a pretty nutritious pollen, uh, source of, of food for uh, insects. It provides uh, a number of different proteins and lipids as well as some carbohydrates. Now, as more and more insects began to feed on pollen produced by gymnosperms, there was a strong selective pressure that those individuals produce excess pollen so they could not only feed the hungry insects, but have enough left over to be transported to a receptive female flower. So over the next 150 million years, plants developed other means of attracting uh, uh, individuals to them by producing rewards for insects, including nectar. And eventually the first true flowered plants, the angiosperms, appeared sometime in the late Jurassic and early Cretaceous period. Now thinking back to our video on the evolution of mutualisms, we can see how this formerly commensalistic relationship between insect visitors and pollen eaters and pollen producers was subject to enough selective pressure to eventually push it into a mutualistic relationship. Now plants beginning to rely on animal vectored pollen could, uh, could realize a number of benefits. For one, the movement of their gametes is now directed. So instead of just sending out um, their pollen into the wind and hoping for the best, insects feeding on pollen are moving it from one flower to another specifically. This allows plants to conserve energy uh, by not having to produce as much pollen, and it also enables their genes to travel a greater distance. 
Plant density is also now less relevant than it was with wind, but it's still ultimately an important factor because the greater density of plants that you have, the more attractive that's ultimately going to be to flying insects that are moving by. If you only have one plant, it's more likely that an insect is gonna pass that by in favor of a larger congregation of, of plants. But this strategy does come with a few costs. By employing an insect, you run the risk of the bug not showing up for work. You also need to invest in the resources to advertise and reward your workers. Occasionally, those rewards are exploited by non-pollinators or they're stolen by pollinators who cheat the system. In fact, cheating is pretty much ubiquitous across mutualisms. Where there are rewards, you will probably find someone who's wanting to exploit those uh, and not give you what you want out of it. In pollinators, nectar robbing is a pretty common phenomenon whereby insects will bypass access to the rewards via the plant reproductive parts, so the stigmas and the anthers where the uh, pollen and um, fertilization occurs, and instead they'll cut into flowers and extract nectar from the sides. Plants can also cheat though, which is pretty unique, uh, and they can trick pollinators into visiting to be, um, by pretending to be a mate or some sort of an antagonistic uh, insect that will elicit a physical response from the pollinator. Either they'll try to copulate with the flower or they'll try to fight with that antagonistic insect and ultimately then pollinate the flower unknowingly and without receiving any reward. So the mutualistic association between insects and pollinator, uh, insect pollinators and angiosperms was central to the radiation of both insects and flowering plants from the Cretaceous onward. We saw this uh, figure in the previous video that we watched. So such a peculiar, uh, particular and in some cases peculiar, peculiar relationships between plants and insect pollinators led to the idea that pollinators could pretty much ex uh, totally explain the diversification of angiosperms. That is, specific floral traits could be associated with specific pollinator taxa. And this excerpt from Keaton and Gould kind of sums that up. And it says that the flowers of each species are adapted in shape, structure, and color and odor to the particular pollinating agents on which they depend. Evolving together, the plants and their pollinators become more finely tuned to each other's peculiarities. So this is kind of basically saying that we can, we can associate specific pollinators with specific plants, as in the case with this Madagascar orchid, uh, which was initially worked on and discovered by Darwin, um, or, or uh, described by Darwin, and um, it took almost a century of, of, of searching to find the actual insect that was pollinating this, in this case, this moth with this extremely long proboscis. So ultimately this led to the idea of specialization, where plants and their pollinators were intimately linked in a co-evolutionary trajectory. And there are a number of examples of specialization, particularly for plants that are large, long-lived, and have a relatively static interactions over time. So the Madagascar orchid that we saw in the previous example and figs and fig wasps are another example of these sorts of specialist interactions. So these sorts of interactions have kind of led pollination ecologists to posit a number of what we call pollination syndromes. These are plant characters that are aimed at attracting and exploiting particular pollinating taxa. So empirical evidence doesn't always hold up and support these associations, but in general, they remain true. For example, um, bees are primarily attracted to flowers that are white, yellow, blue, and purple, that have a particular aroma, that have a particular shape. Whereas um, uh, hummingbirds are usually attracted to larger flowers that are typically kind of a red, white, green, um, or red and orange coloration. But these don't always hold up in, in reality. But they are general trends. So in reality, most plants, even those involved in obligate mutualisms, are visited by more than one species of pollinator, and pollinators typically visit more than one plant taxa. So generalization, it would appear, is actually more the norm than the exception. So this strategy is typically favored as floral rewards are similar and not predictable over space and time, and the fact that pollinators have to spend energy and, and there's a cost associated with traveling between flowers. And that cost is typically pretty high. So the, that is that foraging efficiency is a really important determinant of how pollinators choose the plants that they visit. And we can see here in this figure that 91% uh, of species in this particular meta-analysis are visited by more than one uh, 
insect, and some of them were visited by almost 300 different insects, which is pretty crazy. So despite a tendency towards generalization, insects co-evolving with specific assemblages of plants do retain some specialist tendencies. Bumblebees are a great example of this. So while they're a highly generalist species, they'll visit a number of different plants across uh, evolutionary history. Um, they are particularly adept at extracting, for example, pollen from cranberry and tomato flowers. And this is thanks to a physiological adaptation called sonication or buzz pollination. And we're going to talk more about these specific adaptations that occur across pollinator communities in the next video, actually. So although we like to think of plant pollinator mutualisms as equally coevolutionary, um, we do find that insect pollinators exert stronger selective pressures on the plants that they visit. So if plants are certainly exhibiting selective pressures on, on pollinators as well, and pollinators have, have evolved a number of features to allow them to extract rewards more efficiently. We can think of um, yucca moss and fig wasps from the previous videos as examples of those. However, studying these relationships on mobile organisms is pretty difficult for obvious reasons. So flowers have evolved a number of highly co-evolved traits that make them very attractive to visiting insects, including bright contrasting colors, as we can see here with this bumblebee visiting a rose flower, specialized nutritional characteristics, and specialized signaling mechanisms on the flowers themselves that direct pollinator movement and visitation patterns to ensure adequate pollination and actually guide insects to the rewards that they're offering. So plants in this relationship are, are kind of like vendors in a busy street market. They're trying their very best to attract a potential buyer that's passing by. They're saying they offer a sale, they have really attractive products to offer, and ultimately, um, They'll try a number of different strategies, and whatever ones will work will ultimately get conserved and passed on to the next generation of market vendors. And there are a number of cases where plants have evolved some pretty extreme strategies to, be, to ensure successful pollination, including separating their male and female flower parts both in space and in time. Again, we can think back here to the fig wasp, where the female and male receptive flowers are separated in a considerable um, amount of time. And that allows the very unique and highly evolved evolutionary relationship between those species to exist. So next up we're going to focus on the diverse uh, set of pollinator communities that actually um, uh, are central to these mutualisms and we'll discuss some of the cool adaptations that exist within them.